that's a good song. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. I hope you know you're saved. Amen. Uh, we're going to begin this morning with Psalm 22, verse number 22. Begin our day together. We read, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So as we are in the midst of the congregation this morning, let's praise the Lord and let's declare and lift up his name. Amen. Uh, so I hope you'll join me in that this morning as we stand together and go over to hymn number 165. Song 165, as we stand together, we'll sing our first hymn. Raymond's going to come lead us in singing this morning, O oh, Worship the King. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hymn number 165, O oh, Worship the King. Good to have each one here. Brother Jesse, would you start us off this Sunday morning with a prayer, please? Amen. Let's go over to song 243 at this time. Song 243. Victory in Jesus.
seated. Three people. We've sung two songs of salvation uh, here this morning. So three people. When were you saved? Who'll be the first? When were you saved? Miss Brenda. March 31st, uh, uh, 2013. 2013, amen. And to the saved people. Yes, ma'am. Amen. February 2010. Amen. Somebody else say this morning? Oh, we've got two. We'll take two. Let's go, ladies, first. May 1994. May 1994, and then Brother Jeffrey. February 2008. Amen. Good. I hope you know you're saved. Amen. And that song we just sung, Victory in Jesus. I'm thankful for that. A couple quick announcements. Well, we've got a few announcements this morning, so I ask you to pay attention as we kind of go down through those. Um, I have, actually, Shen's going to have, Shen, can you grab those Bible reading plans there on the corner? Shen has the Bible reading plan. If you were in the meeting last week and asked for a printout of the Bible reading plan, and I know we gave them out Wednesday to those who are here, but if you are not here Wednesday and still need your copy, would you just raise your hand? Shen's going to head toward the back, and Shen just kind of hand those down. Now, these are all... Um, Double-sided. All right, I, I only had one person ask for a single-sided. So, Shen, we've got some over here you can go. We've got some over here. You can just kind of go around and... Oh. Okay. There's a couple over here as well, I think. One near the back there. I might be short one. I'm not sure. Anybody else who had asked for a Bible reading plan... Over here. Did I print off enough? We've got one left. Shen is now selling this last one for $25.99. <laughs> no. All right, uh, just put that back down here, Shen. I'm sure someone else will lay claim to that. Uh, again, folks, the cost for those is $10, and that's just to cover the cost of the binding, and uh, you can put that in the offering. We'll do that on your honor. I know you're all honorable people, amen? So uh, you can either e-transfer that or just put that in the offering, all right? You don't need to mark it. Um, anyway, just put it in the offering and uh, it will go where it needs to go. Um, we have two meetings after the morning service. One is for the group that up till this point we've called the college and career. And that's kind of been a broad spectrum group. Uh, basically, it's been anybody from uh, teen group, once they graduate from teen group, up until we've had some come who are knocking on the door of maybe the uh, seniors group, but uh, we're going to seek to clarify who this group is a little bit. So college and career, we're going to meet down here right after the morning service. That's just going to be a very quick meeting. Um, and uh, I will tell you as well, we have a, an activity coming for the college and career group this coming Friday. We're going bowling at Polo Park. Um, 6.45 is the time to be over there. We'll speak more of that during that, uh, that quick meeting, all right? Um, so there's a meeting for college and career. Secondly, there's a meeting upstairs for the ladies this morning, all the ladies. Uh, there's an upcoming ladies meeting in January, well, we're in January, the end of the month, I believe it's the 27th. Um, is that what it is, 27? I know Mrs. Haley had texted some of you ladies. Um, 27th, uh, that's a Saturday. Is that right, or 26? 27, yeah, we have youth on 26. So 27, there's a ladies meeting. Um, so there's gonna be some information regarding that ladies meeting that's upcoming. And then also, if you've been involved or want to be involved in what was called the Secret Sister, um, then the, the Secret Sister program, then there's going to be some discussion during that meeting as well. So we'll have the college and career meeting first, because that's going to be just a couple minutes. And then we'll have the ladies meeting following that. Um, and that'll give Mrs. Haley time to get up from downstairs uh, and the junior church program. So 
I'll probably forget later on to announce that again. So just remember that, okay? Uh, we have tonight 515 prayer time, six o'clock evening service. Don't miss out on that. Uh, I will announce next Sunday evening, not tonight, but next Sunday evening, Pastor Robert Wall from Faithway Baptist Church. Now, my wife and I went to Faithway Baptist College many moons ago, amen? Uh, a lot of years ago, and he's gonna be here. He's in town next week, and he's gonna be here next Sunday evening. I'm looking forward to this. I know most of you have never met him. Let me encourage you to plan on being here next Sunday evening, and uh, he'll be a blessing to you. Don't miss out on that again. That next, that's next Sunday evening. Pastor Robert Wall from, the, again, the Faithway Baptist Church and College in Ajax, Ontario. Um, Wednesday evening, we have a prayer and Bible study, 7 o'clock. Acts 20, verse 24 is the memory verse. I'm just going down through my list here. Looking ahead to February, so looking out a couple weeks here, February the 2nd. So that'll be the week after the ladies meeting, February 2nd, we have our servant supper coming up. Now there's a sign up sheet on the back table for that. We need to know who's planning on attending so we can plan for food. We're gonna have a supper and then we're gonna have a meeting following that to once again remind us of um, expectations, guidelines for different areas of service and such. So that is coming up on February the 2nd. Uh, that is a Friday evening. We're going to try to get going at 6 o'clock. That gives us time to have supper, have a short time of fellowship, and then get into our, uh, our, our meeting, okay? So that again is February 2nd at 6 o'clock. Sign up sheet on the back table for that. And that's open to all people who are serving in some area, whether it's music or nursery, uh, ushering, different areas of service. We would like you to be there for that so we can uh, make plans, okay, for the coming year. And then looking ahead to mid-February, and you say, that's a long ways away. It's not. Uh, next week is getting near the end of February, or end of, uh, not February, end of January already. Amen. So uh, February, the middle of February is going to come quickly. February the 16th, which is a Friday evening, we're going to have a married couples banquet this year. We haven't done this for a couple years, so we're going to have a married couples banquet. You say, I don't, am I married? Well, talk to your spouse and find out, amen. Uh, so it's a married couple's banquet, and uh, we are going to have a great, great time. So that is February the 16th, 6.30. Uh, looking forward to a wonderful evening together, all right? Um, and there, again, there is a sign-up sheet because we need to plan for food. So married couples, this is open to you. Uh, I think that's it for now. We do have another couple sign-up sheets. One is snow clearing, which is mostly full, but there's a couple slots. And then I saw a church cleaning schedule on the back table. Uh, that one's only got one family signed up once. So we've got a few months here of church cleaning to sign up for. If you could help out with that, that would be great. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Do we have any references to the Redeemer or glimpses of grace today? Say, Pastor, it's too cold outside. Uh, uh, that's okay. We can still have warm hearts. We can still be rejoicing in the Lord. Amen. Anybody this morning with a glimpse of grace or a reference to the Redeemer? Yes, Brother Jess. Amen. 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 Thankful for the grace of God that keeps us secure in his hand. We can never be plucked out. Amen. I'm thankful for that. Anyone else with a glimpse of grace or reference to the Redeemer? I've got Luke chapter 4, verse number 34, as I was reading this past week. And I uh, read here in God's word, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And he was called Jesus of Nazareth, and he was called here the Holy One of 
God. And it's interesting to me that uh, even the wicked followers of Satan here, uh, the demons and devils, they know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. I know thee. They knew who he was. Anybody else with a, either a glimpse of grace or reference to the Redeemer? All right. Do we have a favorite hymn this morning? We don't do this a whole lot Sunday morning. We're going to do it this morning. One favorite hymn. Yes, ma'am. Church in the Wildwood. Oh, let's find that. Four, five, eight. Four, five, eight. The Church in the Wildwood. Is the first stanza good there for you? First stanza? Let's sing that. Four, five, eight. Really, do you know this one? All right, let's uh, stand together. We'll sing song 458, and then we'll sing Raymond's third song here following that. Forty-six in your songbook, please. Forty-six. My Savior, first of all. And after this, we'll do the offering.
pray for the offering. Lord God, Namely Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for uh, safety, Lord, for good health, Lord, uh, that we uh, can be here in your house, Lord. Truly, Lord, uh, you are the great provider, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you bestowed upon us, Lord. And as we take up, uh, bring back, Lord, a portion of those things you have given us, Lord, I pray, Lord, that... Uh, you bless this gift, Lord, for the furtherance of your gospel, Lord, not only here in Winnipeg, Lord, but all around the world. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you for that song. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew this morning for the scripture reading, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27. And in this chapter, we jump in on the narrative of the time frame where Jesus had been arrested and there was a mock trial. He was in custody here being accused, and we're going to pick up in verse number 11 and read down a fair ways to verse number 25, where we read those powerful words, his blood be on us and on our children. Um, let's stand as we have these verses read. I'll read down through, and I hope you'll follow along there in your Bible and try to keep track uh, mentally of what's happening here in this story here. Matthew 27, verse 11 to 25. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas 
or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. We are going to go over to song number 322 at this time. Song 322 for our last hymn. And this, the uh, special song will be sung following this. So if you folks would come up during the last stanza, uh, that would be good. So song 322.
make me a servant like you, dear Lord, living for others each day. Humble and meek, helping the weak, loving in all that I say, I say. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Here's my life, take every part. Give me, Lord, a servant, servant's heart. Help me draw so close to you that your love comes shining through. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Servant's heart. Make me a witness like you, dear Lord, showing the love of the cross, sharing your word till all have heard, serving. Whatever the cost, the cost. Give me, Lord, a servant's heart. Here's my life, take every part. Give me, Lord, a servant, servant's heart. Help me draw so close to you that your love comes shining through. Give me, Lord, a servant. Give me, Lord, a servant. Give me, Lord, a servant. Amen. Thank you for that, folks. Had I not been afraid of ruining the melody, I would have sung along with him there. I was getting ready to sing down there, but uh, I would have uh, wrecked it all. So I appreciate that. Um, that song is uh, a song that's that the greatest example of that is lived out in Jesus Christ. Amen. And he was our true example for being a servant. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Amen. And I encourage you to turn in your Bible to Matthew 27 this morning. That was a blessing, that song. Thank you very much. Thank you for those who came on Friday for youth group. We had a good time, played some fun games and had a challenge from the word of God on our words. And I hope the teens will take to heart what they heard, the importance and the power of our words. Not just a spoken word, but speaking, amen? We talked on the phone. But today, how do kids talk? Uh, with their fingers. He said, no, tongue, no, with their fingers. They text, they're on social media, and uh, words are a powerful thing, amen? So I hope, teens, you'll remember that which you have heard. Aren't you glad to be in a warm building this morning? Amen. Amen. Uh, how many were thankful to wake up this morning and see the temperature and the car with heart starting? Amen. Had to start the vehicle twice this morning, and yet someone's always got it worse. Uh, aren't you thankful you don't live in Yakuts? Anyone know where Yakuts is? Uh, Northern Russia, Siberia, it's minus 40, I think, there this morning. Uh, uh, see, it's, it can always be worse somewhere else, amen. Uh, I'm thankful we're here. Uh, let me encourage you, if you open a window now, you say, who in their right mind would open a window? Well, I'm guilty of that, but uh, I know sometimes it gets warm in the building once we get singing and folks sit, being here in the building and all the BTUs, amen, and some people will crack the window open 
But then they don't close the window. I walked in this morning and came walking down the side aisle, and I felt a bit of a draft as I was coming down that aisle. And right about the middle here, one of these windows was, I mean, it was wide open, about this far open. Uh, it hadn't been latched, and the wind blew the door op or the window open. And so that means the furnace has to run and run and run to try to keep up with the cold air being dumped in at minus 25 some degrees, amen. So if you open a window, close it. Not just push it shut, you have to make sure it's latched, all right? Help us out with that. That would be great. There was another window unlatched over here. It was not open, but it was unlatched. So help us out with that. Uh, we certainly don't want to give the global warming crowd any more ammunition, amen? We don't need to be dumping more heat out there. And uh, So help us out with that, all right? Uh, Matthew chapter 27 this morning. Matthew 27. And again, if I forget to mention later on, there's the two meetings, college and career, very quickly, right after the morning service. And then the... Um, Ladies will have a meeting in regards to a coming ladies meeting and the secret sister um, program, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 27. Um, if you look across the page or back a page or so in chapter 26, you'll read there the, the, um, um, the time in which Judas betrayed the Lord. And as we come to later on in the same chapter, uh, which other disciple betrayed the Lord or denied the Lord, I should say? Peter, three times denied the Lord. And we pick up in chapter 27, the morning has now come, and we see again the chief priests, the elders, verse number one of the people, they take counsel against Jesus, and their plan, their purpose is to do what? You see that in verse one, the end of it. To put him to death. Their, their plan was very clear. They wanted to get rid of this, who they considered to be a rabble rouser, a troublemaker. And really the problem was not that Jesus was a rabble rouser or a troublemaker. He came to bring peace, amen. But the problem was he had taken some of their disciples from them and they were jealous and they were upset. And so they were lashing out at him and they wanted him not just gone, but dead. And we pick up in verse number 11, and Jesus now is standing before the governor, it says there, verse 11, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And as you read down through this narrative of this time frame of the life of Jesus, you'll see there many accusations were made, many false accusations were made, and how did Jesus answer them? Did he seek to defend himself? Did he lash out at them? No, the Bible says when he was reviled, he reviled not. Amen. And so he did not answer them. And we see there later on, verse 19, we move down there. And again, verse 18 says why they had delivered him. It was for envy. We read in verse 18, for envy they had delivered him. And then we see verse 19, he's now uh, there before the judgment seat. And the wife of Pilate says to her husband, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? Uh, referring to Jesus Christ. Uh, she had had a dream there. She says, I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And she told her husband, don't get involved in this. But this verse 20 says, the chief priest and the eldest persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Again, they had an agenda. Obviously, who was driving that agenda? The people, but ultimately, underneath of this, you say, well, the Jews were, yes, but you bring it right down to the brass tacks. Who was encouraging them? Satan was at work here. And I hope you'll come back tonight. I'm going to preach uh, a message tonight on how Satan works. Um, I, and I, this is a, a um, splinter, if you will, from the message this past Wednesday. If you didn't hear that message, I hope you go back and watch that um, on our, our uh, channel there. But Satan is at work, and Satan's job is to divide. And we're going to see tonight how Satan does that. But Satan was at work here, and he wanted to destroy Jesus and was using these religious people to do so. And that will tie in later on when I talk about religion. Folks, religion is a problem today. It has been for many, many years. Thousands of years, religion is a problem. Say, we're a church. You can't say that. 
uh, religion is not the same as a relationship. Uh, they're very different. All right, and we'll say more about that later on here. Um, now, I'm just quickly going down through the, the uh, context here. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could pre uh, prevail nothing, and Pilate here was trying to defend, he was trying his, his best to defend Jesus, but he saw that he could prevail nothing. He was not gaining any ground here, but that rather a tumult was made. Uh, today we see riots, we see mobs. Amen. And that's what was going on this day. It says that Pilate took water and he washed his hands before the multitude. Symbolically, he was saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Today we would say this, the ball's in your court. He said, I'm not going to do anything here. He says, whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do it. And those are powerful words when you consider verse number 25, his blood be on us, is what the people said, his blood be on us and on our children. So Pilate here was an important man who was asked an important question. And we're going to get into that here as we get into our, our um, context and the, uh, the verses here. Pilate again sought to release Jesus, but the multitude rather asked for Barabbas. Now, we read this context, I don't know, a year or two ago. I preached a message on Barabbas, uh, but today I want to look at Jesus. Pilate asked the question, what then shall I do with Jesus? And that's a question which all of us have to ask ourselves. What am I going to do with Jesus? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And who was that? Jesus. Jesus. So the gift has been given, right? The question is, what am I going to do with it? Uh, this past Christmas, Miss Heidi gave, uh, gave us, um, I say us, I mean me, a bit of fruitcake. Um, I saw that fruitcake there in that gift bag. What then shall I do with this piece of fruitcake? And you know what I did with it? I ate it. And I didn't share it. Uh, uh, Mrs. Haley doesn't like fruitcake. Hold on. I love, my mom used to make fruitcake. I love fruitcake. What shall I do with this gift? I need to do something with it. Amen. Uh, what are you going to do with the gift that God gave, being his son, his only begotten son? You can choose to set it aside and uh, not utilize that meaning to reject eternal life and salvation through Jesus Christ. You have that choice. Or you have the choice you can receive. The two R words we often use are reject or receive. You have the choice today to do one or the other. Now, that question, what then shall I do with Jesus, we all must consider that for ourselves. Um, many prefer to ignore it, and others try to let other people make the choice, or they put the onus on other people, as did Pilate here. He said, you do what you want with him. Um, many people in our society get very uncomfortable when they are confronted with this question, what are you going to do with Jesus? Um, you can talk today about how, how great the Winnipeg Jets are doing. Amen. They're at the top of the NHL standings right now, I believe still anyway. I know they lost last night, uh, but they're at the top of the standings. People in Winnipeg are happy to talk about how great the Jets are doing. Uh, they can talk about, uh, now I think the Bombers lost last year in the Grey Cup final, but for, was it three years out of four years they've won the Grey Cup? You can go almost anywhere and talk about the Bombers and, and people will be willing to engage you, right? Oh yeah, let's talk about the Bombers. You can talk even about how cold it is because some twisted way in Winnipeg, we have this, uh, this crazy love for cold. You say, not me, uh, some people do. It's almost like a badge of pride. Uh, Brother Ian, I think this morning when he came in, he called, what did you call living in Winnipeg? It's like we're, English Siberia. yeah, English-speaking Siberia. <laughs> That's how living in Winnipeg is like, English-speaking Siberia. And we wear that badge of pride, and people will talk about how cold it is, whether they want to complain or whether they want to rejoice in the cold, whichever. They'll talk about the cold. But you ask them about Jesus Christ and what they've done with Jesus Christ. Have you accepted him? 
all of a sudden, the conversation stops. And people get real uncomfortable with being confronted with this question. They'll talk about many other things, but not this question, what then shall I do with Jesus? And yet, it is a question that none of us can run away from, and it's a question which determines our eternal happiness and our eternal state. And so it's a very important question. Whether the jets are at the top of the standings in eternity, really, how much does that matter? Zero. Whether the Bombers win another great cup. Now, it's great for the morale of the city and sports. Lovers. I understand that. But in eternity, what does it matter? Zero. But what a person does with Jesus Christ, that has eternal significance and bearing in their life. Because one day, each one of us will stand before God and will give account of our life. We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, that everyone may receive. Now, uh, may receive the things done in his body. This is speaking to Christians. Romans 14, 10, 11, and we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ. You can read in Revelation, uh, those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they appeared before God, the great white throne judgment, and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, what happens to them? They're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so everybody will appear before God and will give account. And the standard by which we will give account is the Word of God and what we did with the Son of God, who is the Word of God. So I want us to ask ourselves this question here today. And let's look at here, number one, what has Jesus offered you? What is being provided to us here. Jesus has provided us an opportunity, and what we do with Jesus determines if we'll receive this opportunity and this blessing or not. Now, I've already quoted John 3, 16. What is the end result? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so for those who receive Jesus Christ and those who accept him as their Savior, we are, we are promised and offered everlasting, eternal life. We have this blessing of life uh, for those who will respond in believing. In the Gospel of John, four times we read the phrase, have life. John 10 verse 10 uh, says that they might have life. Life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So we can have, we can possess life. It can be ours. Uh, John 20, verse 31, as uh, the Gospel of John is closing down, it says, But these are written, so the things that we read in the Gospel of John, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So what is the emphasis of the Gospel of John? To prove to us what? That Jesus is the Christ. The Gospel of John is written, and it presents him as the Son of Man. It's written to us to convince us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Amen. And, and it goes on to say, and that believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. A verse we use likely every second week here, John 14, 6. Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So John was written to convince us and, and prove to us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and therefore that believing ye might have life through his name. And so life is offered through Jesus Christ. Can you be saved through believing in Allah? Is Allah Jesus Christ? Uh, the answer to that is no. All right. Uh, how about Muhammad? No. How about Mother Mary or Mother Teresa? No. Uh, eternal life is in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. We can read that. All right. So that's very clear. Um, now, 
in the Gospel of John, we read, and let's look over John chapter 5. This past Thursday, I was down at UGM and preaching to them from Acts chapter 17. We looked at three different sections of that one chapter. And as is true, every time the gospel is presented and preached to a group of people, um, Acts 17, you see uh, some believed and some did not believe. Some were unsure and some said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. But in every crowd, every time the gospel is preached, there are some who will believe what is preached and there's others who reject it. They do not believe what is preached. And in John chapter 5, let's pick up at verse number 39 and verse number 40. John chapter 5, verse 39 and 40. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And so Jesus speaks of coming to himself that they could have life, and yet what did he say of these people here? He told them, search the scriptures. You need to get in and study. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, search the scriptures. Why? For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So as uh, these religious people here read the word of God, uh, we read of these people who it, it's amazing here that the, the Jews, they read the scriptures. The, the Jews knew even uh, the scriptures. They could quote them. They, they, as far as intellectually, they read, they knew the scriptures. And yet, who did they reject? John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, they rejected him. They, they said no to Jesus Christ. And he says there, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And, as, and, and we're, we're amazed at that, that these people read the Bible, and yet they would not receive Jesus Christ. But can I bring that to now 2024? Is society any different today? Are there not people today who read the Bible and yet still reject Jesus Christ? Yep. There's, there's likely millions of people on, on this earth, and more even, that read the Bible and yet continue to reject Jesus Christ. Um, you'll quote a scripture, John 3.16, to someone at work, and they might respond with, oh yeah, I know that one. Uh, they've read it, they've heard it, but does that mean they're saved? Many people continue to reject Jesus Christ. And that's a very sobering thought, that people can read the Bible and yet completely miss the message of the Word of God. Um, again, the, the people today are the very much the same as the Jews were of that generation. Jesus explained to them here that the Scriptures testified of Him, but the Jews uh, dismissed Him, and they would not believe him. They would not see nor believe this truth. And so because of that, verse 40, he says, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. How does somebody have life today? And I'm not talking physical life, being born of water. I'm talking spiritual life. And you can see the difference in John chapter 3 if you'll read that. All right. How does a person have spiritual life? How do they become a Christian? How do they become born again? And people use that term mockingly, but that's a Bible term. Ye must be born again. It's talking about a spiritual rebirth. How does that take place? Through believing in Jesus Christ. Here it says, uh, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So how does a person have life? By coming to Jesus Christ. And again, today there's many people that will go to church. They will come to many things, but they will not come to Jesus Christ. Uh, they'll tell you, don't preach at me. Don't talk to me about Jesus. Again, th th they'll pray. 
They'll read the Bible. Uh, they'll sing the Christmas songs that we sing. Amen. Uh, not Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Amen. But the songs of Jesus Christ, Silent Night, What Child Is This, The First Noel, Joy to the World, The Lord Is Come. How many lost people sang that this past month, about the December? Millions. Billions. Joy to the world, the Lord is come, and yet it means absolutely nothing to them. It's just a song on par with, as I mentioned last month, Santa Claus is coming to town. It means nothing to them. They will not come to Jesus. Jesus offers us the opportunity for life. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And verse 13, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we come to Jesus Christ, we call upon his name for salvation, and when we do so, the Bible says that we shall be saved. Acts 16, a very familiar verse, Serves what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You need to come to Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? Jesus has given us here the, the conditions in Romans chapter 10. Um, Romans chapter 10, verse number 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Here is mentioned the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ was, uh, was, was born and he went to the cross of Calvary, he gave his life, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when a person comes to Jesus Christ, or when they confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, is it simply saying, well, I believe that Jesus Christ lived? Does that bring salvation? No. Uh, just just uh, acknowledging that Jesus Christ lived, that, uh, that, that's like saying, I believe that, that Pontius Pilate lived. Does that bring a person salvation? No, there's something about this person, Jesus Christ, that a person must believe. And we see that here, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart. So we're confessing that he is Lord, uh, that, and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we must acknowledge him. Uh, by acknowledging him, what we are saying, uh, when we acknowledge him that he can save me, we are also acknowledging I cannot save myself. And that's a hard thing for some people to acknowledge, amen? Uh, people don't like to say I can't do it, I need help. Uh, uh, pride. Pride keeps a lot of people from doing things they know they should do. Amen. Uh, some people know they should quit drinking alcohol, and yet they're too proud to ask for help. I'll do it myself. And some people think the same way about going to heaven. Don't tell me how I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven my own way. And the answer to that is no, you're not. And I'm not saying get into an argument with someone, but the Bible says that Jesus is the way. And so we cannot go in and of ourselves. We must acknowledge him as Lord and Jesus Christ. And I'm saying that I'm not good enough. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us something about ourselves. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can a person be saved before they understand that they are a sinner guilty before God, can they be saved? No, because why? They don't see any reason for themselves to be saved because they've never, first of all, been lost. 
They've never seen themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. Now, Jesus Christ still died for them, amen? But until they see themselves as a sinner, lost, guilty before God, as Romans 3 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I must see myself as, as God does. There's no way I could be good enough or do enough spiritual things and go to church enough in order to make God happy with me and accept me into heaven. There's, if I could live a billion years, I could never do enough. Why? Because I have sinned and I have come short of the glory of God. And so before a person can be saved, they have to see themselves as a sinner. All right? Uh, because again, if they do not see themselves as a sinner, they will not acknowledge they need a Savior. All right? So I'm acknowledging I'm a sinner guilty before God, and only Jesus Christ can save me from the penalty of my sin. What is the penalty of my sin? The wages of sin is death. And so there's that penalty, and each one of us is guilty before God. And if I do not accept Jesus Christ, then the Bible says, for eternity, my, my dwelling place will be the lake of fire. And that's a horrible reality, but that's the truth. But God so loved the world that he gave, so that those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ, should not perish. And so we have the choice to believe in Jesus Christ. Again, verse 9 there of Romans chapter 10, uh, we, we see here um, Romans uh, 10 verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse number 13. All of these speak of uh, responding to Jesus Christ. What do I need to do with Jesus Christ? What shall I do with Jesus? Uh, the response biblically is I need to receive him. I need to accept him as my Savior because we are sinners and uh, because we've fallen short of having a home in heaven. The only means or way to get there is through Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible is very clear of that. He is the one we read of. Uh, in the month of December, we read Isaiah 9, verse 6, many times, usually in that month. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is born given. And all of these titles that speak of the coming Messiah, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, they all find their dwelling place in one person, that being Jesus Christ. He is the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. And so, until a person is willing to come to that place where they are willing to admit, I cannot earn my way to heaven. I cannot be good enough to go to heaven. I've sinned against God. I'm guilty before God. I have come short. I cannot attain uh, that, to that level of the glory of God. I've come short. And they believe that Jesus died for their sin, to pay the penalty for, for, uh, for their sin, and that he's the only way to heaven. Until a person admits all of that, then they're not willing or they're not ready to be saved. Um, again, there's an old uh, uh, teaching about approaching a drowning person. Anybody ever take any lifeguarding? Uh, we did when I was in high school. They taught us a little bit about lifeguarding and trying to help a, a drowning person. We had a pool there in the high school, and we'd have to jump in with all of our clothes and, and sneakers on and tread water and approach a mock person who's drowning. The number one rule is, uh, as long as they're struggling, you do not go help them. Because why? When they're still struggling, what have they not yet recognized? That they're drowning, that they're in trouble. All right? They've come short of the ability to save themselves. They'll fight. And so if you approach them when they're in that state, do you know what they will do? They will try to climb up on top of you and likely drown you and then drown themselves. And so you're taught to wait until they either pass out uh, you're taught to approach them. It's called sculling. Anybody ever learned sculling? You come at them on your back with your foot you know, kind of ready to kick them and using a figure eight and you approach them and if they lunge towards you, you know what you're told to do? Kick them right in the face. And that might seem cruel. 
Uh, but you have to get them to the place where they're ready to receive help. And spiritually, it's much the same way. I, I'm not telling people, I, don't, I did not tell you, kick someone in the face to get them saved. That is not what I just preached to you. All right. Uh, but allow them to get to the place where they realize they need help. That they've come short. All right, where they recognize, uh, I'm in trouble, I'm in danger, I need help. And when a person gets in that place, then they're ready to call for help. Help! Help! Now they're ready. All right. Romans 10, verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so how do people today get saved? When they respond to that knowledge that they are a sinner. And they need a Savior. And only Jesus Christ can save them. And they ask Him to be their Savior. Now, Jesus has told us the, uh, the outcome of our choices. If we reject Him, John chapter 3, verse 18 and 36 that we read a couple weeks ago, uh, speaks to the fact that if we reject Him, that we do not have life. And again, that might seem cruel. But... Folks, the, the whole point is we have the opportunity to accept life. We can have life, amen, if we choose to do with Jesus what the Bible teaches us to, and that is to believe on him, to accept him as our Savior. But some people refuse and will reject him. And for those who do reject Jesus Christ, and their names are not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, what is their outcome for eternity? Again, the lake of fire. And, and, and that's a horrible teaching, but that's the truth of God's word. And folks, understand, uh, without that, uh, I don't want to call it a negative message, but mankind deems it a negative message, the truth of the gospel and salvation and eternity really doesn't bring uh, uh, you know, the joy. And we sang that song, Oh, victory in Jesus. But... If there's no hell, no lake of fire, then why does there need to be a victory? You see, there's the truth of hell, and ultimately lake of fire, and there's the truth of heaven, an eternal home, a place of peace and joy, a place where we're with the Savior. But how does a person go there? They must call upon the Lord. And so each one of us is confronted with that question, what then shall I do with Jesus. You have the choice to reject or to receive him. Um, and it is your choice. I touched on this a little bit further this past Wednesday, but God does not force you to make the choice. It's your choice to make. All right. What choice will you make? And you and I, I'm sure many of us know lost people in Winnipeg, co-workers, family, friends, whoever it might be, we all know someone who needs the gospel. Uh, can I encourage you to share the gospel with them? And it's up to them how they will respond. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But those who reject him, uh, there's a horrible eternity awaiting them. And so the question is up to you. And just like Pilate had to, uh, if you go back there to Matthew 27, just like Pilate had to... Uh, deal with that. And just like the people had to deal with that, and they did, uh, what was their response? The people's response to Christ. They wanted him crucified. The, the elders, the religious people, they wanted him dead. And Pilate here asked that question of what shall I do with him? And we all have to answer that for ourselves. I can't answer for you. Uh, the person beside you can't answer for you. I would think today, if we ask the person beside you, uh, what do you want for the person next to you for their eternity? Do you want them to go to heaven or hell? How do you think most people beside you would answer? Heaven. I think heaven. I think every one of us would answer, I, I, my desire is that person would go to heaven. But can they make the decision for you? They can't. You've got to make that choice. Uh, what am I going to do with Jesus? 
the Christ, the Son of God. How am I going to respond to him? Am I going to receive him and accept eternal life, or am I going to reject him? Um, it is a free gift that God offers us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works. And that's put in there for those who think they're good enough to go to heaven. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So that question, what then shall I do with Jesus? Um, I could ask every one of you, what have you done with Jesus? Now, I'm not going to ask you personally today what you've done with Jesus as far as uh, bring you up and ask you, but I do ask every one of you, and to answer in your heart between you and God, what have you done with Jesus Christ? You say, well, I'm in church. Okay, uh, I have a Bible. Well, that's wonderful. And if you don't have a Bible, please talk to us. We'll give you a Bible free of charge. Having a Bible is a good thing, amen? Uh, but do, do not many people in this world own a Bible? Yeah. Are there not millions of people that own a Bible that are not saved? Yeah, just like earlier we read there, the Jews, they, they knew the scriptures, they read the scriptures, and yet they were not saved because they would not do what? They would not believe and come to Jesus Christ, and they therefore did not have life, speaking of spiritual everlasting life. So the question is, what will you do with Jesus? That's not what has Jesus done with you, because he's died on the cross. And he's a savior of all men, especially those that believe, we read in God's word. And so he's done his part. There's a book we've given out before uh, a number of years ago. I need to get some more copies of it. The book is entitled one word. It's called, it's, it's entitled Done. I believe it was Carrie Schmidt um, out of California wrote that book, Done. And it speaks to the fact that salvation and all that needs to be paid has already been paid. By Jesus Christ. Amen. The work is done. All you and I need to do is what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So today have you made that decision? Not have your parents made the decision. Uh, I went to church for years. My parents were Christians. They believed in Jesus. Uh, I had not yet made that choice. After years of attending church and hearing the gospel, over and 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 over. All right? Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Yet I had not believed. Until at 13 years old, I finally believed in Jesus Christ and accepted him as my Savior. So not is mom or dad saved. Um, are you saved? Not is your spouse saved. Because there's lots of people who the spouse is saved, but the other spouse is not saved. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you haven't, then... Uh, what is the right day? What is the accepted time, according to Corinthians? Uh, now, today. Today is that day. So I can wait till tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Um, I don't know today. I didn't, I didn't do a study on this, but uh, how many people died this last week between last Sunday and today just in Winnipeg? I don't know. I don't have the answer. Uh, were there some group of people that passed away this past week? Yes. Some through old age, uh, natural causes, some through other causes. Maybe there was an accident. Maybe it was the cold. Whatever was the vehicle, the means of their death, some people died from last week to this week. You understand that uh, someday, unless the Lord tarries his return, Someday, or unless the Lord does come and, do, and uh, does not tarry his return, and we're caught up with the Lord in the air, someday your name will be on that list of people who passed away this past week. Um, are you ready for eternity? What have you done with Jesus Christ? Pilate made the wrong choice. He passed it off and let other people decide. Uh, you can't let other people decide. Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Amen. Uh, my prayer is if you've never been saved, that you would be saved today. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gift that you tell us of in your word, being your son, your only begotten son. 
And Father, you give each one of us the choice today to either receive Jesus Christ and be born again and have eternal life, have that promise of a home in heaven, and the many other wonderful blessings and benefits that go with receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior, or we have the choice to reject. And rejection comes in two forms. It comes in a form of outright saying, no, I will not accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Or it comes in the form that we read of in Acts where some people said, we will hear thee again of this matter. And really that's stalling, procrastinating, putting off till tomorrow. Father, what we know we should do today and what a dangerous way that is to operate. Again, because we don't know what will happen even tomorrow, even the rest of this day. We don't know what the outcome of this day will be. And so, Father, I pray that we would be sober-minded about this. Lord, that if there be one here today who has never been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that they would make that decision before it's eternally too late. Father, how sad would it be when asked the question, what did you do with my son Jesus Christ? Father, their response to be, well, I knew I should be saved. I, I heard that message that day where I was implored and instructed to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation, and yet I thought I had some more time. I thought I could put it off till another day. Father, those who have not received your Son will for eternity bear the consequences of that. And that is a sobering thought. Father, I pray that you would work in hearts. If there be a young person, a middle-aged person, or one who is older today, that they would make that decision to call upon Jesus Christ for salvation. Because now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. With heads bowed and eyes closed... Pilate asked that question that we all have to answer for ourselves. What then shall I do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to do with Jesus today? And you can't look to parents. You can't look to a spouse. You can't look to family. Well, my grandparents, you can't look to them. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your savior, understanding you're a sinner and you've come short? You see, until that understanding comes, you're not ready to be saved because you don't think you need a savior. And so if today you understand you're a sinner in need of a savior, would you talk to us before you go? So, well, preacher, you said you've got a meeting. I will postpone that meeting long enough to talk to you. That's more important. Your eternity is more important than a meeting. We can't force you. I can't arm wrestle you into believing in the Lord. You've got to make that choice. If you're a lady and you would rather talk to a lady, there's some ladies here who will open a Bible and share with you how you can know for sure you're saved. What better way to start off the year 2024 than by accepting that free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ? And then maybe today you've been trying to work with someone, you're praying for someone that they would be saved. Be not weary in well-doing. Keep praying that God will work in their heart. That God will bring them to that place where they understand they're a sinner and they need a Savior. And then be ready to give an answer of the hope that dwells within you when that person finally comes around to asking questions. So I'm going to ask the piano to play a song of invitation today. And if God's working in your heart, please do not leave this building before you find peace with God through Jesus Christ.
Father, I pray today for those who have sat under the preaching of your word. I thank you for their patience. Lord, there may be some who, in their heart, you've been convicting them today of their need of a Savior. They've sat there and politely been patient, and yet they've been in turmoil throughout this service. Father, I pray that they would not go home in that same turmoil. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the drawing of the Holy Spirit, convincing them that this message was for them, that they need to be saved. Father, I pray that you continue to draw. Father, we thank you for that work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we pray for others who have either heard this message or will hear it, that you would draw them unto yourself and that they would come to that place where they understand they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, we ask that you would go before us this week. We pray your watch care. Lord, I pray for those who are dealing with loss of family and loved ones. Lord, that you would continue to comfort and strengthen them. Lord, we ask that you would uh, just help us as we have a couple meetings. We ask that you'd be glorified in and through our living. As we sang that song earlier, living for Jesus. And it's not just today, but it's every day. Would you help us to do that? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, again, we're going to have a very quick meeting down here um, for the college and career, and then following that, a quick ladies' meeting, all right? So college and career, if you'd come to the front right away so we can have that meeting quickly, that would be great. Otherwise, you are dismissed. <laughs>